for the introduction. Facial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve, which has a complex course with intratemporal segment as the most torturous and complex of the intraosseous cranial nerve, arguably. Many important structures, such as the middle ear and inner ear, are re related to it. So radiographic imaging is a very important diagnostic tool to evaluate the facial nerve pathology and exploration prior to otology surgery. So there are magnetic resonance and computed tomography, which are still used today. So for MR or magnetic resonance is usually done to evaluate the facial nerve course of the non bony course. Meanwhile, the CT scan is usually used to evaluate the bony course or the intratemporal portion of the facial nerve. And since the intratemporal portion of the facial nerve is very closely related to the middle ear and inner ear, it is very important to otolaryngologists. So the comprehensive knowledge of the facial nerve course and see on CT imaging is very important for an otorhinolaryngologist. So the problem that I would like to discuss today, what are the radiological landmarks of the facial nerve, its expected anatomical variations, and how to best identify the nerve course on CT imaging? This, this discussion aims to provide better understanding and comprehensive knowledge in identifying facial nerve course on CT imaging. So let us begin the discussion. Facial nerve is divided into three parts. The first one is intracranial portion, intratemporal portion, and extratemporal portion, which is then divided more into the intracranial portion into intraaxial and cisternal segment, and the intratemporal portion into metal, labyrinth, tympanic, and mastoid segments. For the first portion, intracranial portion is best evaluated on MRI. It starts at the cerebral, cerebral cortex down all the way to the pons or of the brainstem to reach the facial nucleus. Here, some of the, uh, some of the fibers decussate or some synapse with the facial nucleus at the epsilateral side. After that, it runs posteriorly to around the abducens nucleus before finally runs anteriorly to finally emerge at the pontomedullary junction. When it exits the brainstem, it becomes the cisternal segment. It then runs laterally with the intermedius nerve together to enter the uh, IAM or internal acoustic meata. It then begins the intratemporal portion of the facial nerve. So the intratemporal portion has the length of approximately 14 millimeter. It starts when the facial nerve enters the internal acoustic meatus and exits inferiorly via stylomastoid foramen. The first segment of the meatal segment starts at the IM and ends at the apex or the fundus of IAC or internal acoustic canal. Its length is about 24 millimeter. However, on CT scan, we can only see the IAC. We cannot really differentiate which one uh, the facial nerve compared to other related structures inside the IAC, such as the vestibulocochlear nerve. To differentiate more of the facial nerve, we need to perform MRI. Next, the labyrinth segment starts when the facial nerve exits the IAC and runs anterolaterally to reach the geniculate ganglion or the first geni. This is called the first genu because after it reached the geniculate ganglion, the facial nerve then turns posterior and laterally to become the tympanic segment. Labyrinth segment runs between the cochlea and uh, the semicircular canal posteriorly. This is the uh, shortest of the facial nerve segments. Uh, at the tympanic segment, it runs horizontally from the geniculate ganglion, posteriorly and laterally, and sometimes it is co also called the horizontal segment. 
At first, at the anterior, we can see it runs between the cock and the cochlearyform process, and it runs laterally and posteriorly to reach the uh, superlateral to oval window, and it runs inferior to the lateral SCC. Its length is about 8 to 11 millimeter. Until this point, we can evaluate the segments of the facial nerve on axial plane of the CT scan. Next, after the, the tympanic segment reach posteriorly, it will then make the second genu or the second turn inferiorly. This posterior or second genu uh, marks the beginning of the mastoid segment that runs inferiorly inside the facial canal and exits at the stylomastoid foramen. For the mastoid segment, it is best to look at, uh, at on CT scan on coronal plane of the CT scan instead of the actual plane. Because on the actual plane, we can only see black dot of the mastoid segment since it runs inferiorly compared to uh, the coronal plane. On mustard segments, the facial nerve gives off three branches. The first one is the subpedial nerve. The second one is called the tympani. And the third one is the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. We can also evaluate the branches of the facial nerve on CT scan. The first one is the subpedial nerve. So this one, this big arrow is the facial nerve. The curved arrow is the stapedial muscle and the small arrow is the stapedial nerve. So we can see here that the stapedial nerve is actually runs very short to enter the stapedial muscle. And on the image below, this is the sagittal, sagittal view of the CT scan. Here, is the facial nerve and it branches off as the corda tympani. After it exits the stylomastoid foramen, it immediately, immediately branches as posterior auricular nerve, superior auricular nerve, occipital belly of occipital frontalis muscle and digestic nerve. This marks the beginning of the extratemporal portion and after that it enters the parotid gland to give off five branches. So when to use MRI and when to use HRCD? MRI is good for intracranial and extratemporal portions of the facial nerve since it runs uh, not inside a bony canal. And it is also good for perineural spread and parotid malignancy, tumor, uh, et cetera. And for CT scan, it is best to look for the intratemporal portion since it runs inside a bony canal called the fallopian or facial canal. And this facial canal starts at the labyrinth segment all the way to the stylomastoid foramen. CT scan is also used when MRI is contraindicated, such as when the patient use cochlear implant or pacemaker. So after we have performed the CT scan on the patient, we would like to evaluate the temporal bone as a whole first. So there are several settings to make the op, uh, evaluating our temporal bone CT scan optimal. The first one, uh, when we, when the radiologist or the radiographer take the CT scan uh, pictures, it, uh, it will be on axial plane parallel to heart plate, and then about 0 0.6 millimeter slices with 0 0.3 millimeter intervals. What matters to us as otolaryngologists are from this one, the bone window and the reformatting. So for the windowing for temporal uh, CD scan, it is known as bone window, but there is actually more specific windowing for evaluating the temporal bone CD scan. For the window width of 4,000 Huntsville units and the window level, some literature mentioned 800, some literature mentioned a thousand Huntsville units. And after we set the windowing, we need to reformat the CT scan in multiplanar reconstruction or MPR. First, we need to make the temporal bone uh, symmetrical, and then we reformat the CT scan into the basic planes of actual coronal sagittal, and then maybe if, we, if needed, partial and Stanford fuse advanced 
fused of the temporal bone. However, among these fused, among these planes, actually axial plane can give the most information among the uh, five mentioned here. And after we reformat the CT scan, we need to evaluate the CT scan in contiguous, contiguous section instead of the cut planes or the cut pictures that usually the radio uh, the radiology department give us. So it, it is best to evaluate the temporal bone CT scan on DICOM files because temporal bone is actually only three centimeter thickness but it has a lot of, it is tightly packed with a lot of structures. So if we want to evaluate those structures best, we need to have the uh, thinnest slice and we can scroll down, up and down uh, the DICOM files. So first is the axial reformat. Axial reformat is actually the default format of the CD scan, but we can make it more symmetrical and more symmetrical. So I will. So this is the example of scrolling of the axial plane of this temporal bone CT scan superiorly to inferiorly. The first structure that we can see on temporal bone is the superior SCC. We then scroll down until we find here. Well, to evaluate the facial nerve on temporal bone CT scan, we can uh, use two approaches. But the principle is still the same, is to follow the facial nerve from one end to another end. So we can start from the proximal part or the superior part, which is the metal segment, all the way to the stylomastoid foramen. So we scroll down superior to inferior or the other way around. In this case that I want to show you is the first approach from superior to inferior. So first we need to find the IAC since we cannot find the facial nerve itself on CD scan, uh, the metal segment on a CD scan. So we find the IAC here. It runs parallel to the Petro's uh, apex. Here on this plane or, or on this uh, cut, we can, we can see the metal segment or the IAC. And then it gives off a small branch anterior and laterally. This is the labyrinth segment of the facial nerve. It then become the anterior genu or the first genu of the facial nerve. Uh, if we look at the, this gives also a horizontal segment or tympanic segment, but it's just a short segment. We can see more if we scroll down here, we, we can see the tympanic segment runs posteriorly and laterally until it becomes black dot. When it becomes black dot, we can just put our cursor on it to follow the black dot so we won't miss it becomes the mastoid segments of the facial nerve. It will run inferiorly until it will become the stylomastoid foramen, I mean exits at the stylomastoid foramen. So here, we cannot miss it because we put the cursor on it when we scroll down. When it, big, it gets bigger, we reach the stylomastoid foramen and the facial, facial nerve exits the intratemporal. So that is for the actual cut. Next, we can review the coronal reformat. Uh, the coronal reformat, we, uh, we aim to evaluate especially the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. This is from anterior to posterior. Here, when we see the mastoid process, on this cut, we can see the mastoid segment of the facial canal, and it exits at the stylomastoid foramen. 
So the next reformat is the partial reformat. So uh, the partial reformat is an advanced plane, and we don't usually uh, use this on in all occasions. So partial reformat is and Stanford reformat is, are good for evaluating the semicircular canal since it will um, make all of the uh, semicircular canal all seen. For example, such as this one. This is partial view. This is oblique view uh, of the left temporal bone. It shows the superior semicircular canal wholly. So uh, partial view is actually perpendicular, perpendicular to the Stanford view. So for partial partial view, it is perpendicular to the petrous portion of the temporal bone. And for Stanford format, it it is parallel here to the petrous bone uh, of the temporal bone. Okay, so that's for the facial nerve, uh, the normal course. And the next one, we will discuss about the variations. The first one is the facial nerve course in pediatric population. But I want to show that the facial nerve course highly dependent on the pneumatization of the temporal bone. Uh, when the when a baby came to the world, the temporal bone is not very pneumatized. So the temporal, uh, the facial nerve actually very superficial and lateral compared to the three year old when the facial nerve actually become more medial and uh, because of the pneumatization has uh, progressed. Aside of uh, the pediatric population, we can also see variations of the facial nerve in pediatric and adult populations. Uh, it can be summarized as facial canal dehiscence, facial nerve displacement, aplasia or hypoplasia of the facial nerve, duplicated ISC, and bifurcated facial nerve. Almost all of them can be found in all segments, but most of the anomalies or the variations are found on tympanic segment. So this is one of the early report by Schwager in 1995. This is a diagrammatic uh, variations of the facial nerve course. It can be displaced to cover the oval window, or it can be dehiscent on the facial canal, and it uh, or it can bifurcate also. The first one is the facial nerve, a facial nerve canal dehiscent on the labyrinth segment. So on the left side, we can see that the labyrinth uh, facial nerve runs smoothly. But on the right side, there's a dehiscence at, uh, on the superior side of the facial nerve canal. The next one is the facial nerve on tympanic segment. This is actually very common. Uh, most of the dehiscence happen at the lateral or inferior wall of the facial uh, canal at this segment. This is a mastoid segment dehiscence. Uh, on this CD scan, we can see the dehiscence on the posteriorly. It uh, has connection to the intracranial. Next, I want to show you that the facial nerve dehiscence can um, be caused by other pathologies, not only variations. For example, this one is uh, it is caused by the cholesteatoma. There is a isodenslation on the right side compared to the left one. And this isodenslation has been proven as cholesteatoma per surgery after the CD scan was taken. And we can see that there is a facial nerve canal dehiscence on the tympanic segment. Facial nerve canal dehiscence can also be found on temporal bone fracture at longitudinal and transfer temporal bone fracture. Next is the aplasia or hypoplasia of the facial nerve. On these two CD scan pictures, we can see that there is no facial nerve found. And for the next variation is the displacement or the abnormal course. Sometimes it is called, for example, this one, the labyrinth segment, both is displaced anteriorly and it lengthens. Labyrinth segment uh, usually only has three to four millimeter in length, but it has reached seven millimeter. Next is the displacement of the tympanic segment. It is 
displaced more laterally and posteriorly than the normal course. Uh, the next variation is the IAC duplication. So usually uh, when you will look at the IAC, it's only like black uh, dense of the CT scan, but we can see there's a bony septum inside the IAC here. This is also a good example. We can see that the facial nerve exits anteriorly and the vestibulocochlear nerve exits posteriorly but there is a bony septum here. Next is the bifurcation. So the facial nerve become two. And this one is example of the labyrinth segment. This is actually quite rare, even among the bifurcation cases. Next one is the tympanic segments. We can here see a very thin bony septum, which is not usually common in the tympanic segment. And the next one is the bifurcation on the mastoid segments. Here we can see that the facial nerve is uh, two black dots instead of one. And here, if we follow it down, we can see that it exits at separate, they exit at separate stylomastoid foramina. So for the algorithm of evaluating the facial nerve on CD scan, First, we evaluate the facial nerve on CT scan only for the intratemporal or the bony course of the facial nerve. And after we get the CT scan, the DICOM, uh, the DICOM files, we need to set the windowing and the multiplanar reconstruction of the planes that we want to evaluate. And after that, we first follow and try to find the normal course of the facial nerve. Just after that, we need to look for the variations or the pathologies of the facial nerve. So to summarize, facial nerve is divided into three portions and the intraosseous part of the intratemporal segment, a uh, temporal portion has complex and structural scores prone to pathology trauma and iatrogenic injury. This portion is best to be evaluated on CT scan. And however, optimal temporal bone CT scan must be achieved to provide good imaging of the anatomical structures. Variations of the facial nerve must be known and um, the clinician must be familiar, familiar with it. To, and they include the adhesions of the facial canal, hypoplasia or aplasia, displacement, duplicated IAC, and bifurcation or trifurcation. Thank you.